bring over a microphone so Irene can start first. Um, can you do that, Robbie? Okay. This is an issue that has to be dealt with in a democracy. If you're going to have social justice and economic justice, you have to deal with this issue. Where are we today? The president said, I'm building a house of health, and I want all of you to move into it. I want everybody to move into my house of health. So what we're doing is laying the foundations and putting up the shelf. Most of the argument that's going on today is not about whether we need to put footings in and whether we need to get the shell up, but we, it's about the issues of what will the countertops be made out of, or what will the bathroom fixtures? Any of you who've done any remodeling or built a house or anything else know that this kind of stuff can really lead to a lot of crazy talk. So the answer is to get everybody into the same house. That's what this is all about. This is a common good issue. This is us looking after each other. This is very important to get passed, and that if we don't get this passed now, we're not going to see it in my lifetime. We can't lose this one. We're too close. We cannot lose it this time. And so that's one of the things that I would ask all of you is get out and talk to people positively. You, you know, we all have something we can say negative about it, but to talk positively about what is happening here because we really need to, to be able to, to talk to people about it. Because as we fought over some of the hot button issues like the public health plan and some of the other issues, some of the really good stuff's been done by, I guess you could call it the workhorses, who are every day fixing this and fixing that. There is significant new funding for community health clinics. Our community and rural health clinics are a fantastic safety net for our whole nation. It begins to close the donut hole for senior citizens. That's not good. It gives immediate help to people who are uninsured who have big problems by creating a, sh a short-term, temporary risk pool, high risk pool, so they're not going to be out there dangling for the next three years. There's a way to deal with it. The bills include 10 to, depends on that final bill, 10 to 12 billion dollars in funding to expand community health clinics to 25 million more Americans. Another uh, piece of this involves the, um, the business community and, and workers. And this is, uh, although people who have their own insurance on the, uh, at the workplace are pretty much left untouched, there are a few things this legislation does that will help people who are working. One is small businesses will get a tax credit, and a generous one, if they provide health care for their employees. A second thing, anyone who is in a large employer and has retiree health benefits. You know that's always a bone of contention in negotiations. They're always trying to take it away. They're always trying to reduce it. What this legislation does is provide a safety net also for large employers who have retiree health benefit programs, a reinsurance plan that will reduce the cost and maintain the retiree safety net for health benefits. And last but not least, you've heard of COBRA. COBRA, continuation of benefits if you're laid off. Currently, COBRA is just limited. It's limited in terms of, of the amount of months and the amount of money. And what this legislation does is allows a bridge on COBRA. For anybody who's laid off, they can stay on their COBRA until 2013. And then one of the final things that I think is just fantastic in this legislation that hardly anybody's talked about is um, the issue of expanding uh, low-cost loans and scholarships to students who are in medical school to become doctors, dentists, nurses, physician assistants, and it will allow for 20,000 new primary care providers to be trained and to get support in that training. Now, why is that important? Well, folks, by 2013, under this legislation, we will have 31 million more Americans getting health care coverage. They're going to need more primary care providers. There's a ban on lifetime benefits. That is, if you've got an illness and you've got a lifetime benefit, you're not going to run out anymore because we're ending that. We're going to allow kids to stay on their parents' insurance until they're 27. And it really is a movable piece of puzzle uh, board so that they all come together and make the picture we want. We're not going to go on because I know you guys probably all have a lot of questions, but 
uh, it's a very, it is an exciting time, and I think that it's incumbent upon all of us just to make sure that, you know, it's kind of like we're so close, we've got to really push the rest of the way. Whether you think that this is, well, the ultimate end thing will be actually a setback for women, um, reproductive rights, will it actually make it worse? Using this as a kind of backdoor way to undo Roe v. Wade simply is not going to stand. Can we move toward, on our own, a single payer system? Slowly, slowly, we are starting with the Massachusetts plan. We, we have put in place in this state, we, have, we call it the Health Insurance Partnership. It was a pilot project that was like the Massachusetts Exchange. It was based on Massachusetts. We didn't get it moving. We were supposed to be offering insurance by the 1st of January this year, but because of funding, we had to stop that. Um, and But we now have grants so that we're moving forward on that. But then the question comes in, if we actually get in the final legislation, the Cantwell Amendment that allows the, the subsidies to come back to us, I don't know that we're going to want to move forward with as much of an exchange because it would be better for us and moving quicker towards a single-payer system if we have all of our low-income the subsidies coming and buying through the BHP, but being able to buy it, so it's, it looks better in that regard. So it, I guess a, a Massachusetts, I'd say, uh, has moved quicker by having the, getting the exchange passed, but I don't know whether the exchange is actually going to be the long-term answer for us. The estimates are that lots of people are going to have to pay 20% or more of their income to cover their medical expenses, and this is going to put a whole lot of people in uh, bankruptcy court. So my question is, what can be done at the state and the local level to uh, improve the equalitarian nature of whatever is being uh, constructed in the next couple of years? I don't think this bill isn't going to take care of all of our problems. We know that. But it's better than what we've got now. There's nothing equalitarian about what we have at this point. And the, the difficulty is, and what you, you'll hear people complain about a lot, it's actually the lowest income, Medicaid, is a great plan. It's a very rich plan, and there's nothing wrong. I mean, being on Medicaid, you get what you need. It's the people in the middle that are the, the ones that are get, get hurt the most now and probably are, is, get hurt the worst in, under this bill. That part is true. But what we have to do is at least move forward and be able to start improving on that, and that's what we're hoping to do with being able to use the basic health plan as a model in this state to be able to provide for those people. And currently, the state it has authorized the uh, health care authority to have a non-subsidized basic health plan and to offer that and so we are going to be putting out for an RFP uh, soon that and their goal is to have a plan that will sell for at an average around $100 a month. I'm going to vote for the bill because I think we're going to get insurance reform because everybody recognizes it doesn't make sense if we don't.